I know that we're probably still waiting on a few people as they arrive and try and find parking and so on, but we like to start this event on time. My name is Colin Engel. I am the chairperson of the Miami Culinary Institute here at Miami-Dade College, Wilson campus. This is now our ninth chef coat ceremony. Good evening. The class of 2016 is requesting permission to be accepted into the MCI family. Chefs, please bring the class of 2016 into the MCI family. Good evening and welcome. My name is Shelly Fano and I am the chairperson of the International Hospitality Center. And the culinary program and the hospitality center work very close with each other. So much so that the students are working together this evening at this event and they have many opportunities to also study together because some of the curriculum overlaps. I have the privilege of recognizing our distinguished Miami-Dade College administrators who have joined us to honor these new students entering MCI who will receive their first chef coat this evening. Our Dean, Diana Bienami from Academic Affairs. <laughs> the Dean of Students, Jaime Anzalota. Jeffrey Larson, the Executive Director of the Virtual College. And Sandy Martinez, who is the new Student Center Director. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank staff, administrators, and faculty from both programs for being here to help honor these students. And of course, all our volunteers from the Hospitality Institute, the Miami Culinary Institute, and the Miami International Hospitality Center. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I know where you, you will get an enjoyable taste of our Miami Culinary Institute. Once again, welcome. Before I was interrupted, um, that was planned, by the way. Um, I really want to thank, before we begin, everyone that's had a part in this uh, event tonight. So Campus Services, the Media Department, the Hospitality Institute that Shelley mentioned, the hospitality students, as well as the culinary students that all had a hand in making this evening um, what it will be. Right now, I'd like to introduce again to you Diana Bienami. I would like to say a few words on, the behalf, on behalf of the Wilson campus. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. We could do a little bit better than that. Good evening, everyone. That's much better. This is absolutely a joyous occasion. 
when we think about how the college continues to strive to offer quality experiences to students in terms of it being an authentic and enriching experience in the classroom and outside of the classroom, I recognize that the Miami Culinary Institute does just that. Not only are we centered and located in an area that will allow you to thrive upon graduation, but we also have faculty and staff that are in the Culinary Institute that really do honor the personal touch. And what I mean by that is you'll find that the personal touch is with intrusive advising, with mentoring, with the opportunities of connecting alumni once you graduate. And so the college itself, we service 50,000 students. What we're striving to do, and I say we in terms of academic affairs and student services, we really do strive to offer that personal touch because after all, we want you to come in and really get a quality experience in terms of the co-curricular and curricular experience experience. As I was mentioning, we service 50,000 students. So what would it mean to have all faculty, all staff, all administrators dedicated towards seeing you complete your program of study? The Wolfson campus itself, we've actually committed ourselves to the college-wide strategic plan as related to making sure that students complete a program of study, making sure that students have an opportunity to transform their communities through the change-making initiative, and then last but not least, making sure that our students have an opportunity to experience a quality academic program, which means that we're dedicated as a campus to making sure that faculty receive uh, the, the guidance in terms of instructional pedagogy, in terms of how they engage you, the students in the classroom. So I, I came up to, to just welcome you on behalf of the campus, but I also want you to know that Miami Culinary Institute is not in this alone. You have the support of the entire campus. Tonight, you have the support of your family and friends, but you now also have the support, as mentioned, of faculty, staff, and administrators as you come in and have a quality experience and, of course, graduate and, of course, move forward in terms of the opportunities that are before you as an MCI graduate in South Florida. So all the best to you. We're excited for you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. I'd like to introduce next um, a very special guest who agreed to um, come and speak to everyone tonight. He's a huge supporter of the college in general. And I know that because I've actually been involved with him on some other projects. And um, this man has served also on, serves on our advisory committee. So let me read a little bit about Peter Schneebly. Peter grew up in the Finger Lakes of central New York State, working in the vineyards since age 13. And he just finished telling me he only made $2 an hour, so think of that. He worked in the grape industry on and off selling grapes for fresh fruit while putting himself through college and then graduate school at Binghamton University in New York, where he earned an MBA. He moved to South Florida in 1989 and took a position as a produce buyer for American Stores, a supermarket chain, buying fresh fruit and vegetables and shipping it to 1,500 stores from California to Boston. Peter got to know Denise Serge while she was selling produce to American Stores, and after a few years, they dated and got married in 1994. Unfortunately, Denise couldn't join us tonight, but maybe Peter will talk more about her. She started Fresh King Incorporated in 1994, soon after they were married, selling fresh fruits and vegetables. After six months, Peter joined the company, expanding it over the next 21 years until they just sold in May of 2015. In 2004, Denise and Peter started experimenting, making wine from tropical fruits. They grew in their garage after work, and after a short time realized they could make wine from most of the fruits that Fresh King grew as their fruit for their new winery, Schnebly Redlands Winery. The winery has grown to include 30 acres, a brewery, Miami Brewing Company, was added in 2011, 
and a restaurant, the Redlander Restaurant, was opened in the summer of 2015. Peter and Denise have four fantastic kids, Mauricio, Monica, Cody, and Gabby, and two beautiful grandkids, Lexi and Nick. If you would put your hands together and welcome Peter to this stage, and let's hear what he has to say. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much for having me tonight, and uh, I gotta say I'm uh, uh, deeply honored by it. Um, while thinking about what I wanted to talk about, obviously I'm gonna talk about my upbringing and my growing up and uh, how I got to here. And uh, you know, so when you think about where I am right now, I have a winery. We make wine out of tropical fruits that we grow down here in South Florida. We have Miami Brewing Company. We um, use some of the local fruits in the beers. And we have the Redlander Restaurant. Uh, we farm now 40 acres, we used to farm 100. And you look at that and you realize that's where I got to. But the fact is I was just like you sitting in those seats back at Binghamton University as a freshman wondering what I was gonna do for a living full time. And what I will tell you is that I think it's very important that you think of it as building a resume your whole life. And you might look at me and go, well, Pete doesn't have to build his resume, he owns his own company. But it's the wrong way to look at it. Because in reality, I'm still building my resume. And everything I do, I look at it as building my resume so that I have all this experience at my disposal when I need it. And it started back in the vineyards in Lodi, New York, which Colin's brother actually has a winery within five miles of where I grew up, which is really ironic, I just, we just realized that. And so growing up, um, I, in fact, I just told this story too. The reason I worked in a vineyard was because I loved grapes. I didn't love wine at 13. I wanted a pair of Levi's, okay? And back then we had a store that was like our Walmart now, and they had a brand called Big Yanks. And just the name of Big Yanks doesn't even sound good, does it? And so when I walked into the school with Big Yanks on at the age of 13, it was Humiliating, you know, it was like, well, we don't have money, you know, you're not status, you're not this and that. And so I went to work for $2 an hour, pulling weeds on a 13 acre plot of ground that had a slope towards the, the lake, Seneca Lake. And my job was to pull those weeds out because, and I had to do it by hand on my knees, because the grape was only this big and the weed was this big, okay? And when I got done and finished that 13 acres in that vineyard, guess what my job was next? Start all over again. That's what I did for the whole summer. I weeded that 13 acres twice. Okay, so I'm weeding this the whole time thinking, I wonder what I'm gonna do for a living. I'm certainly not gonna do this. All right, so then the next job came around and I wanted Jordache jeans. I don't know, maybe you guys don't wear Jordache anymore, but we wanted Jordache jeans. And so the next job was to pick the grapes or put them in a bucket. And so I took the next job to pay a little bit more money. So I learned another thing to have to do with the grape industry. Well, I kept on getting offered more and more jobs because every job I did, I did well. And I tried to understand each job I did. So I moved from that position up to running his produce warehouse when I graduated 18 years old. And at 18 years old, I had 40 people that worked for me. And I was the only one 18 years old. Everybody else was 25 or older, okay? So I did that for about two and a half years. I did such a good job with that that he gave me a job in sales. So I became a sales manager and I traveled all over the United States selling Concord grapes for fresh fruit. Never in my wildest dreams when I was 13 years old that I think I would be doing this for a living, okay? So I experienced that and um, all of my friends were going to college. I never considered myself a very studious person. In fact, I, I was not a studious person. I was a jock growing up. I did every sport there was. And the last thing I did was open a book. So I always thought that I wasn't smart, but all my friends were smart. I just never opened a book. So when I started to succeed in business, I was really, su not surprised, but it was kind of proving a point to my dad and my mom, hey, I'm not stupid, look at me, I'm making good money here. And so I really excelled in the business field. And at the age of about 22 years old, all my friends were graduating from Ivy League schools and going on for their masters. And um, 
I'll never forget this. One of my friends graduated, and he was making uh, very good money working for General Motors. And I called him up to congratulate him, and he said, well, I'm not staying here. And I said, what do you mean you're not staying there? He goes, no, I'm, getting, I'm going to Harvard. I'm going to get my MBA from Harvard. So all of a sudden, this was in the back of my mind, right? So here I was doing very well in business, but there was something missing. Then another thing happened. My boss one day came in, and we had a customer come in to visit us. And he said, um, I'd like to introduce you to Peter Schnebley. He's a lifetime employee here at Venture Vineyards. Now that word lifetime employee, as much as he thought that was a compliment, because I had worked for him since I was 13 years old. To me, I was picturing being 40 years old and having all of his kids coming back into his business and me having to report to them, okay? And I had no way out. So that was on Friday. On Monday, I resigned. He said to me, he goes, I thought you were happy. I said, I was until you called me a lifetime employee. And you know what he said to me? Good for you. Congratulations. That's a great idea. You should go back to school. By the way, if you ever want a job again, you come on back. You're always welcome. All right, so I saved my money, put myself back through school. How many people are really putting themselves through school right now? Okay, so we're relating right now, right? You're making that sacrifice to say, I'm going to save all my money that I'm making. In my case, I was weeding grapes and doing all these things to put yourself through school to get better. Well, I'm telling you, that's the best decision you've ever made in your life. Because I went back to school, and as much as I knew a lot, when I read a book, I learned so much faster than having to go through it and wait the time to learn it. So I went through and I got my bachelor's degree. And when I got my bachelor's degree at SUNY Binghamton, I was broke at the end of that because I'd spent all my money to get myself through school. And my dean comes up to me at the end. He goes, hey, Pete, where are you going for your master's, your MBA? And I said, I never thought I was going to get a bachelor's degree. He goes, well, you have to get an MBA. So I said, well, I don't have any money. He said, you don't need any money. I'll pay for it. So he said that he would pay for my MBA, and I was an undergraduate advisor, and he paid me $5,300 to be a student advisor. I got an MBA. So out of all of my friends, I'm one of the few that have an MBA. And who would have thought that coming out, right? So here I, again, I'm building that resume, right? I'm building a resume. Meanwhile, I always knew I was an entrepreneur, really. So I'm building a resume, then I went and I worked in a restaurant business for about a year and a half, realized I didn't really want to do that. I was director of marketing for a chain of restaurants. Went back to my old boss in the produce business, said I wanted to live in Miami. I wanted to live in South Florida. I want to live where Flipper is. <laughs> where I grew up, there was snowmobiles and all that stuff, and I wanted to grow up where there was Flipper, and I watched Gilligan's Island, and I, I wanted flip-flops and shorts every day. So. Um, Make a long story short, my boss had offered me to go back anytime I wanted. So I went back over with him for about four months. He wanted me to take over the business, by the way, that I had left. He wanted me to buy from him. I said, I really don't want to live here. I want to live in Miami. Well, you come in and work for four months, and meanwhile, you'll get your produce legs back underneath you. And after you do that, you can go down there and apply for a job, and I'm sure somebody's going to hire you. So I went back there. I worked. I got my produce legs back underneath me. I got all my contacts back. And um, I said, when the snow flies, I'm leaving. So in, sometime in November, the snow started flying, and I packed my bags. I moved everything to a 12-foot trailer. Whatever got in that trailer went with me. Whatever didn't, did, stayed back. Moved down to Florida within, I think I got down to 5.30 in the morning. By noon, I had two job offers. Okay, One job offer was the immediate go out there and start making money and brokering. And the boss I had said, Pete, you'll probably make $100,000 your first year. He goes, you've got everything you need in order to do well here. But I recommend this. Why don't you take that job at American Stores? Because if you take that job, you're going to get an education buying produce, everything from apples to zebras. You're going to learn a lot more, and you're going to go through the front door of every business, and you're going to talk to the owner of that business. You're going to learn that produce business from the inside out. So I recommend you do that. And after two years, you can do anything you want. So you know what? I took, the, I took him up on that. And I took that job, and I took a big pay cut to take that job. 
But again, I'm building that resume. I said, if I do this, that builds my resume. So when I become 40 years old, I want to be the most knowledgeable person in produce. Not that I'm a know-it-all, I'm just more knowledgeable than the other people around me. And if I have that, I have the ability to have power to make money. So I did that, worked for two years, then I got sidetracked, I met my wife, she was selling me produce, Denise. And um, as uh, I like to say, I bought the whole thing. So she is gorgeous, um, she's a fantastic mother, fantastic partner in life, and I, I regret she's not here, she, she's with my daughter tonight. And so she was selling me produce, and so we got sidetracked, I got sidetracked, so when I fell in love with her, we spent two years where I still worked and she worked, then we got married, and on our honeymoon in the Mafia, Italy, we decided to start Fresh King Produce Company. We both had this drive to own our own business. Now at this point, I'm 32 years old. I had really thought I wanted to wait until 40 before I started my business. But all of a sudden we realized, you know something, let's get this thing going before we start a family together. So make a long story short, she started first and she had some uh, growers in her back pocket and she knew customers like me. And, uh, and so she had customers all over the country. So she started the produce company, she started Fresh King. And within the first three months she did a million dollars worth of sales. So here we are working out of our house We've got our dining room table, she's on one side, I'm on the other side at night doing a filing. And we realize that we gotta hire somebody. So I start writing down the descriptions of what that person had to look like, and I realize that was me. So as crazy as it sounded, we had just got married four months earlier, as crazy as that sounded, I had set myself up and she had set herself up for us to do this. I took the plunge and I quit my job. And so in the first year of Fresh King, we did $3 million in sales. How do you like that, huh? Not too bad. Okay? So that was in uh, 1994. My son Cody was born in 1994. We started a produce company, and we were on our way. And it did very, very well. Every time we made money, we invested in land. We bought more and more land. We started farming more and more things. So the thing that I started weeding, remember I told you? I needed to know that stuff. All the stuff I did with harvesting, I knew how to do all those things. I knew how to manage all those people. Okay, so every job that you've ever done will come back and will, you will need those skills. You'll need that knowledge. So then the next thing we did was we realized, you know, down here in South Florida, God doesn't produce every fruit perfect. Some of the fruits are a little bit off. Some of the fruits have little spots on them. Well, Publix does not want a piece of fruit with a spot on it. Okay? So I invited my friend Bill Wagner down from New York State. And Bill Wagner was one of the first pioneer wineries in New York City. He was one of two wineries that started in 1975. And in 1975, nobody ever thought that Bill or the other winery were going to, were going to uh, make it. They just thought that they were going to allow them to do it. The state changed the law that allowed them to have their winery. Before that, you had to have a, a lot of money and a big bond. After that, you could have a small bond and a small winery, and you can go and make your own wine. Meanwhile, they're in the middle of no place making wine in Lodi, New York. There's only one person in this room that knows where Lodi, New York is, okay? There's more cows than people in Lodi, New York when I was there. So flash forward 30-something years, Colin, how many wineries are out in New York? Over 300. Over 300 now, all around the Finger Lakes. So I invited Bill down to visit me because I wanted to get into agritourism. Now, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think I could make wine I was just bringing him down to understand agritourism because I wanted to get into that great industry. So Bill came down, traveled down to visit me, and after a little while, he spent three days with Denise and I. On Monday, after he arrived, he goes, I want to sit down and talk to you. I know what you should do. Okay, Bill, what do you think we should do? You need to start a winery. I said, Bill, I don't have any grapes. He goes, you know how to make wine? I said, no, I know how to drink it. I have no idea how to make wine. How you make, I mean, you stomp it, right? He goes, well, do you know that le lychees are fruit and grapes are fruit? I said, yeah, I never thought of it that way. He goes, well, I'm making wine out of fruit. It happens to be grapes. You can, have, you can make wine out of fruit that happens to be lychee, mango, guava, or any of these other wines, any of these other fruits. With that, and I'll, this is the other thing I'll tell you, make sure your ears are open because people will tell you what to do next if you have your ears open. If you ask it for advice, make sure your ears are open and you're listening to what they say. Because Bill told me what to do. And if I had never invited him down, if he had never said these things, 
I wouldn't be up here talking to you about hospitality management. Okay? It would not have happened. But God was looking out for me. And he was looking out for my wife. And when we asked for help, it came. And when he said it, we did it. So we started a winery in Miami. And Bill says something else. He goes, by the way, if you start this winery, you'll be the southernmost winery in the United States of America. Just that alone is great. He goes, you'll also be making wine out of lychees and mangoes. And I don't think anybody in the world's ever done that. He goes, the other thing is you're next to Miami. Do you know how many people live in Miami and how many people travel to Miami? So those are the three reasons we started Schnebly Redlands Winery. Okay? And we've sold over a million dollars worth of bottles since we started. We average about 2,000 people a week come through our facilities. Okay? And we have the very best business you could ever have. What fun it is to sell wine and now beer for a living. Okay? So I'm going to try to wrap it up because I know I'm going over my five minutes. But we also realized something else. As the wife was pulling the husband to go to the winery, the husband was like, I don't like wine, I like beer. So Bill Wagner, my friend, started a brewery because he realized the same thing. So we started Miami Brewing Company. We were the first craft brewery in South Florida uh, when we started four and a half years ago. Now I think there's over 20 breweries down here now. Then we realized, you know what, we should have food here. All of our customers are saying they really want food. So we started something called the Red Lander at Schnebley's. The Red Lander has uh, one of the most famous chefs in Miami, Chef Dewey Lasasso, who was a chef at the Forge restaurant for uh, five years. So you put all those things together, and we got a great business that, by the way, has the ability to withstand time. Some businesses, there's changing technologies. This is a business that is old school. It's not, it's not changing technologies. By the way, it's also a business that you can, you can give to your kids. It's a business your kids want to inherit. It's a fantastic business. So to summarize it all, I would tell you that make sure you're building your resume throughout your life. Even if you plan on being your own boss, don't look at it that way. Look at it as these are the skills that I'm constantly getting that fill gaps. And when you get done, make sure there's no gaps. Whether you added a clean a restaurant, a restroom, or pull weeds, I've done it all. And I can supervise somebody on how to do it. Secondly, it's a, very, it's a distinct honor for me to serve on the board. Um, I believe in giving back to your community. I'm, a, I'm on a few boards down here. I'm on Farm Bureau's board. I'm on Teva's board, which is the Tropical Everglades Visitors Society. I'm the president of the Redland Tropical Trail that we founded back 10 years ago. And uh, being a part of this board um, is an honor because I saw this start from the very beginning before it was even thought of. We were actually on a cruise talking about uh, the culinary school starting uh, probably, what, about 10 years ago? Yep. And here it is. So um, what I like to do on the board is come on in and look at the curriculum and give my critique on what we need as, as the industry and what you guys are getting as an education. So when you get done, you can plug into what we need and we can offer a good paying job. Okay? So best of luck with your careers. Uh, if there's anything I could ever do to help any one of you, uh, please come on down and, and look me up and I'd be happy to mentor you the best I could. Thank you. We have a, a gift for Peter for um, thanking him for speaking to you tonight. And um, I, he sincerely means it. You know, I, don't, I think he might have mentioned that we have a couple of our graduates working down there for him now. So he really walks the talk. So thank you, Peter. All right, thank you so much, Peter. Um, I'd next like to introduce David and Elaine Duran. They've come all the way from Kissimmee tonight to speak with you. We first met them at the home show, I believe, here in Miami, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, David was a warehouse worker, and he lost his job after suffering a heart attack in 2010. Elaine switched from her Disney manicurist job, corporate job, into what she calls survival mode at that time, which included a lot of baking. A cake decorating class and exposure on YouTube 
led to a call from TLC and the offer to appear in Next Great Baker's fourth season. They competed against nine other teams, and David and Elaine made over-the-top desserts, like a Paris-themed wedding cake and a 600-pound, six-foot-high candy tower, which I can't even imagine. But they were eliminated in the fifth episode during a scary ingredient challenge where they had to add blue cheese to red velvet cake, okay? <laughs> the Durans had won the Carabas dessert challenge the week before, though, and that placed their divine pineapple pound cake, say that three times fast, in 240 of the chain's restaurants for a limited time. The flamboyant Kissimmee couple run an online custom cake business called Enticing Cake Boutique, and have been known to sport leopard cuff tunics and create cakes decked with purple rhinestones and gold leaf. Never a boring cake is their motto. Elaine says the next dream is to open their own shop. Our high, Elaine says, was being on the show and winning that challenge. Their low was going home before the finale, but hard work always pays off. So here to tell you more about their journey, our Elaine and David, please welcome them to the stage. Good evening, um, alumni, faculty, staff, and most of all, chefs. Uh, I, we are so excited to be here today, and I'm accompanied by my amazing friend, partner, husband of 13 years. David, will you stand and just say hello? <laughs> it's been a journey, and it's been an exciting journey, and it's, uh, it hasn't always been a fun journey. But in order to finish the race, you have to start somewhere, and you can't give up. And so as you were speaking, <laughs> I can so relate when you were saying um, the resume, the resume. Uh, the resume is so important because I was, a, I was a manicurist for 22 years and I would do itty bitty nail art with all the rhinestones and all the gaudiness on acrylic nails. And um, I switched over into the corporate world and I was making more money than I can imagine. Except I was so young that you didn't prepare for the worst. They never told us, well, if something happens, you need to prepare for it. And, and so we, David and I were already married at the time and we had two babies in diapers and we have a six and an eight year old. And um, they had uh, let me go from that corporate job because of the economical incline. And so at that point, uh, I had had a friend who purchased me a $10 class at a local craft store. And she goes, you know what? We've been doing nails for such a long time. I bet you we can do uh, all that little nail art on a bigger canvas. And I was like, you know what, you're right. Because we kept buying cakes and they kept falling and they wouldn't make it because it's hot in Florida and our events were outside. But anyway, on that journey, um, my best friend here suffered a heart attack. So I was making so much money at the time, we were very comfortable. I said, why don't you be Mr. Mom, enjoy the children, they don't have to be raised by someone we don't know, and then we're able to, to you know, they're able to enjoy daddy. And um, I won't be there, but I know you'll, you'll do a wonderful job. And so when that happened, the same day that craft store was um, to start their, my baking, my, I'm sorry, cake decorating class for one week, um, they brought me into the room at my corporate job and said, I'm sorry, you're one of our top sales reps, but we have to let you go because the company's downsizing. So at this point, you can imagine, I have my best friend, I want to make sure he lives because I need him there, and his children need him, but at the same token, I also... Um, I'm thinking, how am I gonna put gas in the car next week? You know, how are we gonna buy diapers? How are we gonna buy milk? Oh my goodness, and, um, and so I started my journey later 
You know, I went straight to the class, the class, the baking class that I had started the same day they let me go. So for self sanity, and so I wouldn't have to go home to my wonderful husband and tell him, honey, guess what? They let me go. Um, I don't know how we're going to make it through the rest of the year. I went ahead and chose to go to the cake class. And the teacher, the first thing she said was, introduce yourselves. So I said, my name's Elaine. Um, I was fired today. And this is going to be my new business. I'm here to reinvent myself. I kid you not, that's all I could think of. I, was, I stepped into desperation and survival mode immediately. And I said, God, if you don't have my back, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because at this point, this is it. And so, as you said, uh, your past experiences, all that artwork. I do have an arts degree. And I worked in retail all through my high school years. And I had to self-market myself when I was doing nails. I had the opportunity to do a lot of celebrities. And so you begin to develop your professional skills. And so I remember sitting, um, doing nails once, saying, this isn't for me. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. I, and I knew it was a part of the journey, but I didn't know where it was going. And of course, I use everything that I learned through my journey, even now. I would say, why math? Oh my gosh, who invented math? Yet I use a ruler, it's like my best friend and my exacto knife, you know? And so, moving fast forward, I, start, I took that class and I remember that I was consuming, at this point, I, we were so desperate to pay the bills, we didn't know, we had already tapped into, into, tapped into our 401k, we had depleted everything that we had because we had to survive at that point, that I said, oh my gosh, and that was the season where Cake Boss came out, and it was season one of The Next Great Baker, and Dana had won. I don't know if any of you watch Cake Boss or if you've watched The Next Great Baker, but Dana was the first winner of season one of The Next Great Baker. And so I had just started my cake journey, and I'm watching this going, wow, I wonder if I could do that one day. Now, mind you, I didn't have the privilege and the honor uh, to, to come to such a prestigious school, to have such an amazing staff and, and, and amazing chefs to be mentored like you do. Absorb that, run with it. I didn't have that. My, 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 my whole momentum was because I didn't know where my next meal was gonna come from. I didn't have the luxury of being able to sit here and having a chef coat ceremony. When I got here, I got emotional because I didn't get that. My chef coat ceremony was when they gave me my red coat and I wear it with pride, you know. I didn't have the, 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 the blessing to be able to learn amongst the best, you know, in the state, in the nation. You have, you have amazing uh, 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 teachers and staff that are willing to give you 110%. They wouldn't be here if they didn't care about their students. I didn't have that. And so all I had was YouTube and every cookbook and every TV show, culinary, Food Network, and TLC were my best friends. And I had to put my poor husband to the side and the back burner. And I remember my kids and I would break night because I'm a mommy first. And so I'd raise them during the day. They weren't in school yet. And I remember rocking my children because they'd wake up in the middle of the night. I'm trying to learn a new technique. And all I kept saying is, if I can just sell one cake, I can buy a box of diapers. If I could just sell, if somebody will buy just one cake for me for 20 bucks, I can get milk for next week. David wasn't able to go back to work. So I was just doing what I could to make it work. And so if it took crying, learning a technique while I'm rocking my baby, trying to make it work, and the feeling seems so real because the struggle was real. And some of you are here and you have children and some of you are here and you don't have children and everybody has a story to tell. But you know, it's your own personal story. And so the struggle is real. It's what you do with it. How do you turn it around? Where do you see yourself five years from now, those short-term, long-term goals? Where do you see yourself next year? Where do you see yourself six months from now when you're in this program? Where do you plan on working? Even if it doesn't work out that way, your ways are not God's ways, but he knows what you're thinking. He knows your heart. And so where you set off, he will guide you the rest of the way. You just take the first step and he'll guide you the rest of the way. 
And that's all you need to do. I remember when, okay, so I'm gonna go back to where I was because what happened was I consumed every recipe book, I consumed every YouTube tutorial, I consumed every, every cookbook, I consumed every, um, every TV show. And, and once I learned one technique, I went from that technique to another technique. And when I knew I had that technique down pat, I went over and I, and I started another technique because now I got this one down pat. So I know now at least I can sell ruffled buttercream cakes, okay? But I can't can't sell the fondant with the with the royal icing because I haven't mastered that yet. But I'm going to hone into what I know and get really good at it. And maybe they'll buy those until I get better at this. And so my sister one day comes up to me. Now we're in the ending of the first season. After eight months, my sister comes up to me and she says, you know what? You're getting really good. You should open a Facebook account. And I said, Facebook, what's that, right? So I finally said, um, if you think so, you open it and I'll put the pictures in. And I'm not really techie. And so um, I started, she helped me put the pictures up and everything. And then she saw the show and that they were casting for the show. And she said, you know what? You should put in for that show. And I said, are you kidding me? I've only been doing this for like six months. These people have been doing this for ages. You know, how am I even supposed to compete with somebody who's been doing it for six months? And she goes, no, you don't understand. You really got what it takes. Now, mind you, I really thought that she was just being nice. That's what sisters do, right? They're just being really nice. So she brought the paperwork. I filled it out for kicks and giggles. And I said, here, if this makes you happy, we'll do it. Sure enough, though, two months later, I get a phone call and it said, you know, so-and-so entertainment. And I honestly thought I was getting punked. So I just, you know, they said, hello, this is so-and-so entertainment, and we'd like to talk to you. We'd like you to be on the show. And I hung up. I freaked out. So here I am working towards this big moment, and then I have to, like, kill it, you know? And I was like, oh, my gosh. So then I called back to entertain the thought. I said, well, what if nobody's playing a prank? So I call back, and I go, um, and she says, it's okay. It's not the first time that it happened. So I was like, phew, Okay. So I called back and they said, look, we've been following you on Facebook. We got your application. We'd love to have you on the show. Why don't you come down for an audition? And I almost fell out my chair because here I am and I've just been so stuck on survival mode, trying to get to the next level, just trying to get, just trying to pay the bills, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents, like they say. And all this time, I didn't realize how, how good I was getting. I had no idea. Even when I first got the phone call, I still was kind of taken back because I was like, they want me to be on the show? Like, oh my gosh. So I got to admit, when they flew me down and I came back home, I reanalyzed my situation. I reanalyzed my life. And I took a step back and I was like, wow, I can do this. It wasn't just, it wasn't just me trying to make it work. I, I think this is it. This is it. And so what happened was as time went by, they came up to me and they said, you know what? Thank you, but no thank you. We want a Latina with an accent, and I don't have one. I was born in Delaware. And so they said, we've decided to go with someone from Miami. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's okay, because I'll tell you what. When I had that phone call and they said, no, thank you, you don't understand. I felt like I had still won the trophy because even though I didn't get on the show, that lit some fire under me. And I said, you know what? They said no to me now. They're not going to say no to me next year. So if I ever got more anxious to learn even faster and quicker, I knew that they were going to do their drafts for the next season the following year. And I already knew they knew who I was because I had already gotten an audition. So at this point, I said, you know what? I got six months to get better. How fast can I do it? How quick can I make it? I had nobody to turn to. I had no mentors, no one. You have that. I didn't. And I said, my mentor is going to have to be YouTube. I have no choice. That's it. And so I researched Weinstock. I researched, oh my gosh, you name it, all of the big names. And everything they did looked so incredible to me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. But let's just stick to where you're at, focus, just go on to the next. Then what happened, I realized that if they called me to be on the show, that means I could start a little website. I started selling cakes. People started hearing. I got auditions. Now I'm making money. There's, I'm putting food on the table. And I'm saying, wow, my dream is coming true. I may not be where I want to be yet, but I am so on my way. The next year came around. I didn't have to reach out to them. They reached out to me. They said, wow, your work is so incredible. How you've grown over the, over in, in less than a year. He goes, we want to give you a private audition. Why don't you come on down? Before I even got down there, they called me back and they said, thank you. 
but no thank you. We've decided to go with a metropolitan area and, and we were still looking for the accent. And I was like, well, couldn't you have told me I could fake the accent, you know? But uh, anyways, they, um, I could if I had to, but you know, it's a reality show and they really want real feelings. And so anyway, so it didn't work like that. And I, at this point, I was already, um, my business was established at this point, right? Money's coming in and things are looking brighter. And, and, and this is the incredible part, okay? So now I'm trying to get on the show and um, they're really upsetting me because they keep bringing me up here saying we want you and then they keep saying, um, uh, no, not, not right now. And so I said, at this point, I said, you know what? I'm not gonna focus on the show anymore. I'm not gonna focus show, now I'm gonna focus on the family, I'm gonna focus on the business, and I'm gonna focus on how I'm gonna make it better for my community. How can I get back, how can I pay it forward? What can I do to establish what I have here? What am I gonna do? So I got a call from Cake Central Magazine. I don't know if you are familiar with Cake Central Magazine. It is the most acclaimed magazine in the world for the cake industry. And so they gave me a phone call and they said, we, we have this um, picture and we'd like to give it to you, it's a mood board, what can you do with it? And so what I did was I just, it was a lady that was wearing grapes on her head and there was a cherub and I was like, I don't know what to do with this. So I just uh, put my thinking cap, I let my creative juices started flowing and I created this um, vintage cake winery for a winery theme. And the title was called Harvest. And so um, I took that prophetically because I was harvesting for my future. And so I did the best that I could. I got a buddy of mine who's a professional photographer, took pictures of the cakes. We submitted it. They were, they were just wanting to, put it up on their magazine. I thought it was an honor. They called me back. They said, congratulations, we're gonna feature you in our magazine. I thought that was wonderful. Now I'm getting noticed more and more. Mind you, it's only been a year and a half of this venture from the moment I picked up a piping bag. It's only been a year and a half. I'm trying to do this to put things into perspective because if, he, if, if it happened to me, it can happen to you. I'm not any different from anybody in this room. I just wouldn't stop. I never gave up regardless how hard it was because nobody said it would be easy and it's not easy, but I didn't give up. And quitters don't get too far. So you just got to keep moving forward. You have to if you want to succeed. There's just no other way to put it. And so from that moment, I remember seeing Cake Central Magazine, they put up an ad that said, we're gonna release a 500 copies of a limited edition collector's book of the best cake artists in the nation. And I remember seeing that uh, ad in an email that I got and I was like, wow, if I could be on that, then I've made it. That's how I felt, I just wanted that you know, that title that I, I got in a collector's book. And so I, what I did was, I, I kid you not, I kind of fell asleep a little somber thinking about, wow, if that could just be me. It's, it's, it's healthy comparison. It really is because it just helps you push the bar. It's okay. And so I remember just going to sleep and I told David, I said, David, if I could just be in that collector's book, Wow, what a title, what a trophy. And I went to bed and I was just so emotional about it because there's certain things that you, you set bars for yourself and you wanna achieve them. The next morning I wake up and I check my emails, I gotta call my clients, I got weddings, I got my brides, I gotta do cake tastings. And I get the email and it said, congratulations, you have been selected to be one of the cake artists in 500 sold, only 500 sold worldwide of collector's books for Cake Central Magazine 2013, Adore. And it was the harvest issue, with, which was the vineyard cake that I had done for them. And so that was an amazing accomplishment for me. I fell to my feet, I started crying. Every moment is a real moment for me. And so, because it's, I can see my journey flourishing and opening and becoming what it is. And so, with all that said and done, on the third year, third to charm, I brought my, I'm gonna go back a little because on my first week of that cake class, uh, my little buddy here, I brought my cake home and I was so excited and I told him, look at my cake, it's my new business and I'm gonna do this. And he goes, I'm so glad you're working. <laughs> 
He goes, because uh, you need to stick to your day job because it was really sad looking. But I was so proud of it. You know, and so sometimes our worst critics are the ones right next to us. And he was like, oh, babe, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. And we had some nephews in the house staying with us from New York at the time. And they were like, ooh, mm -mm, no. And so I got really upset because he criticized my cake. And that's what really set some fire under me. And I was like, I'm going to prove everybody wrong. I'm going to show them I can do this. I'm about to turn heads around and they're going to see what I can do. And uh, sure enough, like even now, he says, I, don't, I can't believe you just did that. Like, how did you do that cake? Well, when we got, they, the, the, the network called finally. And they said, do you have a partner? We're thinking about doing partners this year. And I said, oh, honey. Um, <laughs> oh, supportive one. <laughs> no, he was, he's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. That first week, yes, he, he ticked me off a little bit, but. Um, they Skyped him, and of course, his wonderful personality won them over, and that's all it took. And then they said, congratulations, we've been wanting to put you on, but we've been just waiting for the right time. Keyword, right time. Your right time, you'll know when's your right time. That's why you can't give up. Because you can miss your perfect moment. If you choose to give up a day before, your perfect moment may be right there. You know, and you don't know when that is. So all you have is faith, hope, and hard work. It, it does pay off because I've seen it in my life, and if I wouldn't have experienced it, I wouldn't be able to share it. And I want you to succeed just like I've succeeded. I want you to succeed just like David and I have succeeded. I want you to succeed just like everyone here today, faculty, staff. They are not here in their positions because you know, they just, somebody appointed them. They've earned to be here. They've earned their badges. They've earned their patches. They've done the hard work, and they're here for you because they care. Take advantage of that. Run with it. Be the best that you can be and make your mark in this world. And then most importantly, you figure out why and how you're going to pay it forward. Because it doesn't matter how big, how wonderful you get if you can't bless somebody else. That's the main goal. And so with that, I leave you. We were in, in TLC's The Next Great Baker. We're about to, we're in the works of doing something else we can't say because we're under somewhat contract. And so, but we're excited. We've been blessed. Our, our, we were successful on the show. 240 Carabas across the nation. They featured our dessert. That for us was our dessert. But for them, it was amazing. Thank God. And, you know, the show was aired in 140 countries worldwide. We have our website, we cater to Central Florida and the surrounding areas, we travel, we do our cakes. We have a designer line of couture aprons. We have a recipe book on Amazon, it's called David and Elaine's Great Cake Baking Recipes. You know, we, we're, we have a book in the works that's coming out sometime this year. And so I only say all those things because out of one piping bag and survival mode, all this happened. And again, I stress, if it happened to us, it most definitely can happen to you. So I leave you with that. Thank you, thank you, Miami Culinary Institute for having us. God bless all of you, I wish you the best. How about that, that's amazing. Another round of applause for Elaine, thank you. And on behalf of the Miami Culinary Institute, we'd like to present you and David with these small tokens. Thank you. With that, we're going to begin our chef coat ceremony. Thank you. Culinary arts in Miami is a growing industry, alive with action, excitement, and people. Hotels and restaurants are the vital segments that keep our industry in constant need of trained culinary professionals. Miami-Dade College has an ongoing commitment to fill those needs. We are the largest and most diverse college in the nation, with seven campuses, two centers, and more than 165,000 students from across the world. MDC offers over 300 programs of study and several degree options. In 2009, Miami-Dade College launched its premier culinary program, Miami Culinary Institute. Located at the Wolfson Campus in downtown Miami, 
Miami Culinary Institute has what it takes to help prepare you for a successful career in the culinary industry. Take a look at our state-of-the-art program where technology and expertise come together, creating the perfect formula in culinary education. You'll learn why food, culture, and innovation are part of our recipe for success. MCI curriculum starts with the Food Production 1, which is essentially the principles of cooking, with the knife skills, history, knowledge, safety and sanitation, flavor profiling, and technique. Miami Culinary Institute has taught me a lot about food. They've uh, taught me different ways to prepare it, where it comes from, even the history behind the different foods. You learn visually and hands-on. We can give you terminologies and the basic foundations to help build you as a future chef. The history of uh, Escoffier and, and creating sauces. Being in class is one experience, but then being in the kitchen is completely different. It makes it a lot easier to learn when you have great teachers that are willing to teach. We have phenomenal courses and we have one of the best leaderships out there. I learned that the MCI culture is about helping the students and providing us with the best amount of opportunities. We have Asian, Colombian, Caribbean. You're just immersed in this community of so many different people. We've worked events from Susan G. Coleman to uh, Coconut Grove Art Festival. Our different colloquiums where we get to meet really talented chefs and see what they do. We also do a lot of outside events. We're very involved in the community. We have all the latest equipment. We have an on-site garden on the campus. I'm interested in learning about new technologies such as molecular gastronomy and sous vide techniques. We also emphasize in the future how the industry is changing. Not only do we have our own garden which they use in the restaurant, but also through the new equipment that we use in our lab. Things like this wine theater where uh, they, they film us and give us an opportunity to be a television chef. The favorite thing I've learned here is to work as a group. And this taught me very strong communication skills, relying on others and sharing responsibilities. It's been a great learning experience and working hands-on is the only way to learn. You gotta be willing to learn. You can't just want to come to school and then leave. You gotta be willing to volunteer your time and it really pays off in the end. My fellow instructors, they're very talented and they will bring out the best of any students. MCI has given me uh, a strong foundation, a belief within myself that I can be the next top chef. Our goal is to be chef, but we also can create and be creative and stay passionate about something that we do. Food, culture, and innovation are our three main ingredients to a future of culinary success. Along with hard work and dedication, you will have all the tools necessary for your journey to culinary greatness. Welcome to Miami Culinary Institute. Good evening. Luisa Adio. <laughs> Zande Alzate. <laughs> Elira Andieu. <laughs> Lorenzo Aroche. <laughs> Wolf Bertrand. <laughs> Umberto Calero. <laughs> Adrian, Adrian Castillo. <laughs> Caris Class. Elizabeth David. <laughs> <laughs> Cristina de Armas. Mark Deus. Benjamin Fortson. 
Good luck. <laughs> Rebecca Gonzalez Mejia. <laughs> Williams Gonzalez. <laughs> Alexis Harrison. <laughs> Shamaya Hill. <laughs> Carrera Howard. <laughs> Demi Isaac. Sharon Jimenez. <laughs> Ian Lewandowski. Nicholas Leonard. <laughs> Nora Marquez Rangel. <laughs> Shamiza McLeod. <laughs> Ken Roy Miller. <laughs> Armando Montana. Brian Morales. Renaldo Nelson. Baranya Nino. Richard Ojeda. Hector Pagan. Monica Platzas. <laughs> Julian Rosenberg. <laughs> Cassini Ruiz Leon. <laughs> Louis Sendoya. <laughs> Jennifer Suarez. Diana Sunol. Anna Vasquez. Ismael Velasquez. <laughs> Ryan Vega. Kevin Zelaya. Danny Smith. Amir Wahid. Give it all you got. Federico Unda. Paula Castro. Nitza Vicente. Angel Byerly. <laughs> and Richard Vidal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Outstanding. Let's have another round of applause for our 2016 class. How about another round of applause for our guest speakers? They're uh, fantastic tonight. Yeah. Some very inspirational messages. I do want to say one thing um, before we head out to this uh, reception. I want to make sure and invite all of the new class to take part in all the opportunities that the college and the institute gives you. I think you've probably already heard or you're going to hear a lot more about our stagiaire program, the events we participate in, the opportunities to meet local business owners, celebrity chefs, and so on. 
that no other college around here gives you that opportunity. And that makes us very unique. So please take advantage of it. One person I'd really like to thank that does almost all of the work for this event is Jesse Vasquez. He's sitting up back there. So everyone is invited to a reception. But before that, um, oh, I'd like to make sure that our class stays behind to have some photos with our, our um, administration and our guests. And everyone else can follow the fork and spoon to the food and drink. Thank you again for being here tonight. Yeah, let's have every, everyone up on stage. And, and we'll have our administrators and our faculty down in front, our guests down in front. Dancei o twist até demais Mas não sei, me cansei Do calypso ao tchá-tchá-tchá Só danço